And um, we thank those presenters who have gathered here. And Rick Bennett, we're going to go ahead and start with you so you can take care of things as needed. Thank you. You do need to unmute, Rick. There you yeah, go. I just noticed that. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. For those of you who may be watching this later or didn't hear at the, at the hospital, uh, my mom has COVID, and so that's why I've got the mask on, but hopefully you guys can hear me good enough. So, um, yeah, so I talked a little bit about some of the early schisms in the church. Uh, just to review, um, there were nine or so leaders following the death of Joseph Smith. Um, I discussed about five of those, nine or ten, I guess. Uh, Lyman White's church in Texas, they're uh, no longer extant, uh, but they're the first temple. They were temple builders, uh, the first temple west of the Mississippi, um, and that was in Texas, and uh, that settlement basically dissolved, and most of uh, Lyman White's descendants joined the RLDS church. Uh, another one was James Strang. And his claim to fame was uh, an angelic ordination on the, di the day that Joseph Smith died. Um, he also translated some uh, glory plates and a few other plates. And so he exhibited a lot of the same uh, characteristics of Joseph Smith. Their church is still in existence. They've had a few schisms, but the main one is probably in Voree, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, uh, Bill Shepard's a uh, wonderful story and a member of their church that I uh, interviewed previously. Uh, another schism is the Sydney Rigdon slash William Bickerton Church. Maybe I should share, I could share a couple of my slides, but it'll probably be a little bit easier for you guys. Uh, I can share my screen. I won't share the whole presentation with you, but I'll share a couple of slides here that'll help. Um, so Sidney Rigdon and William Bickerton, they started the uh, what's known as the Bickertonites, it's the Church of Jesus Christ. It's probably the third largest restoration group after the LDS Church and the Community of Christ. Uh, I believe they've got about 10,000 members still. Um, so they uh, traced their uh, leadership to Sidney Rigdon, who uh, following the uh, uh, death of Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young actually communicated with each other and Sidney started his own church. And then it kind of fell by the wayside, and William Bickerton kind of picked up the pieces in Monongahela, Pennsylvania. They still practice speaking in tongues, still believe in the Book of Mormon. They do reject the Doctrine and Covenants, though. So that's kind of interesting there. Um, Alpheus Cutler, the Colorites. Uh, they are down to about nine members in Independence, Missouri. They're just a few blocks south of the uh, Community of Christ Temple in Independence. Uh, they have. They also are are, are temple uh, people. They uh, perform sealings like the LDS Church does. They have an endowment like the LDS Church does, um, but they are down to about nine members. Um, so they're, they're very small, and uh, most of them are old, although there's a uh, some that's in the space, so they open up and keep, keep things going. Um, Granville Hedrick was another one. Most of you are probably familiar with the Temple Lot group. Um, they uh, are just like, west of the Community of Christ Temple and in Independence. Um, they also claim to have about 10,000 members, uh, but uh, yeah, they're just a small, small group. I don't, I don't know that they're actually that large anymore. So those are kind of, those are five groups that I covered kind of below the yellow line. Uh, I figured most people know about LDS and RLDS, so I didn't need to cover that. <laughs> and uh, William Smith kind of joined with the Community of Christ, so that's kind of where he ended up, but he kind of started his own church. William Marks also ended up in the L RLDS church. And then David Whitmer's church, I'd like to talk about him, but I don't, I don't have any good experts on that. But yeah, his church is no longer extended. So 
Then I also talked a little bit about some of the modern um, schismatic groups. I'll just go by pictures here. Uh, Jim Van Cannon was part of the Remnant Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, Jim has since split off from them. They have their own little secession crisis. Um, Terry Patience is the new president of the Remnant Church. Uh, they are just northeast, north, yeah, northeast of the Community of Christ Temple and Independence. And uh, they're kind of old style RLDS. They still believe in lineal succession. Well, they, they kind of believe in lineal succession. <laughs> Uh, Fred Larson was their prophet, he was a descendant of Joseph Smith, but Terry Patience is not, and neither was Jim McCann. So, um, but anyway, um, so there, that's one group. Uh, this next picture is a picture of Ann Wild. She kind of re represents a bunch of fundamentalist groups. We've talked about a bunch of, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of different groups there. And uh, to be honest, she's an end of what she calls an independent fundamentalist. They practice polygamy. There, the independent is probably the largest group of polygamous groups. Um, and they're not really affiliated with anybody. So uh, that's kind of interesting. The Denver Snuffer, uh, he started his own group um, known as the Remnant Movement. It, technically, they are not a church. <coughs> Drink water here. But uh, so he's a prophet uh, based in Sandy, Utah, very strongly anti polygamist, very pro Book of Mormon. He's come up with his own sort of scriptures. Uh, these next two guys are part of a polygamous group called Christ Church, or yeah, um, they call, still call themselves the Righteous Branch. They believe in polygamy and uh, they're kind of. Uh, they, their group started in 1978, uh, just uh, April 1978, by a guy named Gerald Peterson. They've got a couple of temples, in, one in Nevada and one in Southern Utah, uh, kind of pyramid shape. Uh, Lindsay Hansen Park on the middle row here. She is not a fundamentalist, but she's kind of, she's not only the director of the Sunstone Foundation, but she, uh, we discussed the FLDS church. and. Uh, so she uh, she's kind of a, well she's an expert on a lot of fundamentalist groups, but we we kind of got into the FLDS church and Warren Jeffs and that sort of thing. Um, the next picture here is Christopher Blythe. He's an LDS, but kind of a little bit of an expert on Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow situation. They are a couple of ap apocalyptic prophets. Uh, that killed their children and are currently awaiting trial in Idaho, uh, which is just a terrible story. We also talked a little bit about the Lundgrens, a uh, similar story in Ohio. Um, he was a breakoff of the RLDS church. And so some of these groups uh, kind of have nefarious motives. Um, this is a picture of John Pratt, the late John Pratt. He died shortly after my interview. Um, he was an astrophysicist, and he joined with the Brazil group of a prophet by the name of Mauricio Berger, and uh, he's still alive, Mauricio is. Uh, John, unfortunately, passed away from COVID by, last October. Um, but uh, they, we talked a little bit about the Seal Book of Mormon um, that Berger has. And uh, John was in the first prison before he passed away. Uh, next picture here is John Conrad. This is the one group of all of the groups that actually does not believe in the Book of Mormon anymore. Uh, in fact, they would not even, they would not identify as even a restoration group, but their founder was a guy by the name of Maurice Glendenny. Um, he had joined the LDS church in the 1950s, I believe it was, or 40s, maybe. And uh, he had some visions about Moroni and had some revelations and uh, a lot of scholars kind of considered them part of the restoration group, um, but they're uh, more messianic Christians who practice a lot of Jewish holidays and they do have some revelations pertaining to Moroni, so that's kind of interesting. 
Uh, the bottom two are uh, kind of the newest groups out here on the left. We've got uh, Dave and Christine Fairman. They are the uh, co-presidents, co-prophets of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. They're kind of an internet organization and meet over the internet. They do temple work over the internet. Uh, they accept both LGBT members and polygamous members, uh, which is kind of unusual to accept both. Usually you're pro-LGBT or, or pro-polygamy, but not both, um, but they're, they are kind of both that way. And, uh, kind of an internet church based in Ohio. And then finally, Matthew Gill, I'm, I'm probably gonna be having him on as a guest here in about a month or so. Um, he's the prophet in the UK. <coughs> Excuse me. His claim to fame is he's translated uh, the book of Jeronek. So he received some uh, plates from the angel Raphael. <coughs> Excuse me. Coordinate him to be a prophet. And uh, so he's based on what the uh, book of Jeronek. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, talks about how the Temple Stonehenge was built. These were people, basically, <coughs> oh my goodness, people who date from the time of the Jeronek. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to grab a drink so I don't uh, cough anymore. So I'll put myself on mute and turn it over to somebody else. Okay, thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. Um, Paul, are you still on? Okay. Well, I see him, but he's not responding. So um, let's see, Blair, are you? Is Blair here still? I think, I think maybe I can be heard. Okay, now you can. All right, well, if I can be heard, and if you can, if you can lay my uh, slides out, we'll try it this way. I, my connection has been poor, and David has tried to supplement, and his gets about the same as mine. So let's try it and see what we can do. Okay, so what do you want me to do? You want me to bring the slides back up? Yeah, put my slides up and I'll, I'll talk about them. Okay, let me see if I can find them. I maybe closed them down. Hang on. Oh, no, there we go. Um, can you see that, Paul? Oh, no, you can't because I ain't sharing. Hang on. Hang on, I gotta share the screen. There we go. Now, can you see it, Paul? I see you, I don't see the slide. All right. <laughs> I see the slide. I see the slide. Okay. Um, other people are seeing it, Paul. I'm not sure why you aren't. Okay. Um, well, I got it, Jenny Reader. Other, okay, if the other people are seeing it, that first slide, if I recall, is uh, is oh hey, it, it's starting to come through. <laughs> that is, it says Deb Blues Comanche has started sharing slide sharing. So that's uh, then my internet connection is unstable. Okay, so Jenny Reader was the there. First there it is. There you got it. Okay. All right. Well. But that's the introduction that I was going to use just to sketch through the people that uh, were invited to, to come back tonight, beginning with uh, Jenny Reeder. Right, and Jenny is not with on us. On uh, the Emma Smith connection to the woman. And then we were going to, uh, and she was, she was pointing, pointing out that Emma was partner with Joseph, that he was protection and comfort for her, for her husband, and also for the inspired version. And that she was a person of performance from the hymnal and the Relief Society 
having been the scribe for 116 pages. And then I'm not sure if we have Blair Bryant on yet. Uh, I'm pre presuming he'll, he'll be on to he speak for himself. Been. And anyway, his, his uh, efforts to understand the character uh, plates, the character writings, um, has been a lifetime pursuit. And again, I wanted to compliment him for that tremendous uh, effort to, to help us understand the characters. And then go on to the next slide. Well, we have, we have, uh, there we have Rick Bennett, he's already spoken. And we have uh, Eric Turner, he's on tonight. Casey Kern's on tonight. Um, so they can speak for themselves. George Patton Pat, Potter was, uh, was on last week to share about the Jaredites in, in uh, Peru. And he emphasized the culture of Corral, which beginning about 3100 BC has a lot of parallels with Sumer. And so his emphasis on the possible connection between the first civilization and the Americas and the Sumerian was most intriguing. All right, can we go on to the uh, Oh, you used some nice flowers on, on those slides. Very good. But uh, can we go on to the to the other display where I start with uh, I am? I was reviewing the DeBarth presentation on the uh, the uh, universality of the Book of Mormon message. I don't believe I got that. Oh. This is all I got was these six slides. Well, if you didn't get that, then uh, hmm, I wonder if I can pull it up because I sent it to myself as well. Um, let me see if I can, uh, well, I, I think that's not likely. Let me just give a quick summation then. Okay, can I go ahead and uh, stop sharing? Yeah, I, you stop sharing. I, 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 I will just simply try to summarize uh, because, well, if we don't have the slides, then let me just re see if I can reiterate the, the story. And it may be that I get myself on, on the screen here. We'll see. Is that, uh, um, that doesn't appear to be working either. I can All see right. you now. You can see me? Yes. Okay. Well, the, the, uh, the presentation I, I gave was a, a substitute for Richard Howard, who was no not available, and so I substituted the the uh, archetypes of mythology that we see in in uh, the study of myths compared with the Book of Mormon themes, and among those we find that that in the beginning there's a big question mark. In the beginning, uh, the the stories often begin once upon a time and that when, it, when the story begins once upon a time that's one of those in the beginning there's a big question mark so when we say in the beginning god we're really saying there's in once upon a time we don't know uh, when the when the beginning with god is when we uh, trace that process through those once upon a time stories have a theme by which the uh, the protagonist the hero will work his way through a bunch of serious dilemmas and ultimately come out in the promised land, uh, living happily ever after. And so when you look at the parallels between the universal archetypal stories and the stories of the Book of Mormon, there is a very strong parallel that uh, makes it so that if we approach it correctly, I think we can demonstrate the Book of Mormon to be universal scripture following the same pattern of many other uh, cross-cultural stories that, um, that people retain, believe in, and, and recognize as embodying significant truths by which to live. So those, those uh, archetypes, those truths by which to live incorporate uh, many individual types. There are 12 types that I cited in the, in the earlier presentation. The individual type is, uh,
uh, one of the kinds that you can go on an archetypal page and, and try yourself to. I think we've lost him again. We have, oh, you're muted now, Paul. Paul, you're muted. All right, the group archetypes are the kinds that uh, people use for working their way through the wilderness. They work their way through the desert. One of the themes is the quest for water. Another is the quest for salt. That one is often tied to the Cinderella theme. Uh, we have group themes that, uh, that focus upon the, the quest for the promised land, love, of is a major theme. And these are themes then, of course, that we also find in the Book of Mormon. Uh, the conflict in a family is uh, one of those universal themes. And clearly that one is a major one in the uh, Book of Mormon story. And so my point was that when we start looking at the universal themes and recognizing them in the Book of Mormon, they apply internationally, they apply around the world. And our understanding of how those apply gives us an opening, I believe, to share the Book of Mormon scripture, the Book of Mormon story as universal scripture, and particularly because it promises that uh, we all can work our way toward the promised land. The message that Christ said that he had other sheep that were not of this fold, and he had been out to, to communicate with uh, brother Jared 2000 years before his birth, and he had been to other places. He was going to other places. And so the evidence that Jesus was attempting to get that message across the, the globe is a message I think that we should be looking for because other cultures will pick up on those themes and they may put variants on them. But from 2000 years ago, there's enough change to make it so that if we look carefully, we'll see the, the Jesus message in most of the other cultures in the world, especially in the great religions. And so my hope was to encourage people to recognize the universality of the Book of Mormon, to recognize that the call for other sheep and the call for us to appreciate the promised land is a call that is open for everyone, that the Book of Mormon scripture says that Jesus was inviting everyone to the promised land and that, uh, that it would be their choice land above all others. And if, uh, if you recognize how our world has been populated, people have chosen to go to their promised land and live there. Some in the Arctic, some in the, in the uh, Amazon rainforest, some on the mountains, some on the plains, some on the sea coasts. But uh, we choose where we want to have our promised land. And one of the choices we need to make today is to make our thinking change so that we can participate in the promised land of Zion. Going back to the creation, I think that we look at uh, at the Garden of Eden story, and we see that when Adam and Eve chose to eat off the tree of uh, good and evil, they dichotomized and moved themselves their thinking into a lower standard, so that rather than the kind of embracing thinking that was characteristic while they were in the Garden of Eden, they got kicked out to where they're thinking about, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're bad. Okay. I still see him, but I don't hear him. Blair, I think, um, why don't you go ahead and start your presentation? Because Paul is now gone. Okay. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. I'm not seeing it yet.
Okay, now you are. It's a black screen right now. A black screen? Yeah. Oh, summary, black. reading the CT, people, plates, and records. We got you. You got it. You got it. All right, I'm not seeing it on my screen, though. Um, how am I going to do that then? All right. Are you seeing the Zoom meeting right now? No, I'm I'm seeing my uh, my screen, but I, I'm trying to get it to start the, the um, start the slideshow. Doesn't want to start. Resume slideshow. It doesn't want to do anything. Okay, well, perhaps if you start, stop sharing and then maybe read your things to us without us seeing them, is that easier? Uh, let me try something. You want me to stop the share? Oh, there's no. the character's transcript. There you're going. Okay, I'm going now. All okay. right. All right. This is the character's transcript. Uh, a copy of uh, this was made. These are the copies of the characters made from the Joseph Smith plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated and presumably also taken to Professor Anthon. Uh, back in 1828. Um, my, uh, my work with this started in 1994, and I uh, have translated that. And what I want to talk about is the plates and the people and the records that were in those uh, in the characters transcript. Um, these are the, the plates that were given to Joseph Smith. Well, not all of these. Let me talk about the first one, this set of plates. Can you see my cursor here? Can you see my cursor? Is this, there a red is, dot? this is the brass plates. Right. All it's right. a red dot, right? That's the red, red dot, yes. Right. Um, the brass plates were quoted by Nephi in the small plates of Nephi. Then that's the reason that we know that Jesus was going to be coming in the Book of Mormon uh, 600 years before he came. It quoted the brass plates, uh, which was uh, from the, primarily from the book of Isaiah, uh, that tells about Jesus and uh, predicts Jesus coming. The small plates of Nephi were created by Nephi for the religious record. The religious part, he was the, the priest of the uh, group, the religious leader, but he was also the king. Now, he made the, the large plates of Nephi. He started the large plates of Nephi. Uh, perhaps Lehi himself started it. We don't know for sure. And there's one place that refers to the plates of Lehi. And if Lehi started it, then Nephi picked it up upon Lehi's death. Anyway, the large plates of Nephi are the ones that uh, were translated or, or not translated by a bridge by a Mormon. So that large box of plates were given to Joseph Smith as Mormon's abridgment of the large plates. Now, Moroni was given the task of translating the Jaredite record. Down in the lower right corner here were 24 plates that were discovered by the people of Limhi. And those 24 plates were taken to King Messiah II, who was uh, able, by the use of the interpreters, to interpret those and put them into the Hebrew translation. Now, Moroni's job was to take that record that was probably about 2,000 years worth of record and put it into a summary 
which became the Book of Ether in our Book of Mormon today. That was Moroni's job. Mormon, therefore, abridged these large plates of Nephi to be the first part of this record. And then Moroni slipped the, his record in there, of the Book of Ether. Moroni uh, had a, sh a short section with a few plates where he recorded his own book. But that's what we had that Joseph Smith had originally. Now there were 116 pages of manuscript that were lost in March of 1828. And the translation process came to a halt. There were a lot of things going on in Joseph Smith's life at that time. And Martin Harris lost the translation or the, uh, uh, the, the manuscript, which was the translation of the first portion of these large plates. The Lord saw to it that that section would be replaced by the small plates of Nephi. And Mormon included those small plates of Nephi saying that they whispered to him that they were for a wise purpose that they should be included. And so those were given to Joseph Smith later to replace the 116 pages that had been written before. So this is the beginning. The small plates of Nephi is the beginning of our present day Book of Mormon. Then when it finished the small plates, they started in on the rest of the large plates of Nephi. Actually, um, it's the other way around. When Oliver Codrick came and became scribe for Joseph Smith, they started on page 117, uh, for continuing the story that had been lost in the lost pages. And he translated all of them down to the uh, uh, Book of Ether. And Moroni's Book of Ether came in there at the end. So today's Book of Mormon is quite a bit different from what a Mormon originally assumed that it would be like. Now, these are all the characters in the characters transcript that include the character for plates. Now, the plates character is the vertical slash mark. This is it here, plate, and this is the character for writings. This is plates, this is plates, this is plates, and this is plates to plates. This is sacred plate writings, and so on. Mormon wrote all of these on the left side. And Moroni wrote his part of the uh, character's transcript in a different handwriting. You can see that although this character and this one are obviously the same character, it's certainly written with a different hand. And there's a consistency of handwriting here for those characters. Consistency of handwriting with these characters. Now, I've crossed out some characters here because those are generic characters. They don't refer to any particular set of plates. But all the rest of these characters or elements of these different characters up here indicate specific set of plates. Now, I'm going to go to a take out all of these that are marked this way and then see if we can't see what's left over and find some similarities. On the left side, again, that's in the same order that we had them previously, are the characters written by Mormon. And over here on the right are the ones written by Moroni. There's some similarities. We're repeating characters.
So now I'm going to group those characters together because they obviously are talking about the same thing. These characters are all referring to the brass plates. So let me tell you how I know that. This is Christ, this little loop right here on all of them is Christ. This is of Christ. All of these are of Christ. And these are Christ caused to be. Christ caused to be. Now let me break this out. Christ caused to be plate writings for people Israel. Christ caused to be plate writings for people of Israel. Well, that's common to all of these. There's something tagged along at the top that's here. It's also here, but it's not here. None of the rest of them have that. So that's obviously something different. And what I discovered was that that's the word prophecy. So these are prophetic plates for Israel. Now that's referring to the brass plates. The brass plates were taken by uh, uh, Lehi, by Nephi from the city of, of Jerusalem, uh, from Laban and taken to the new world. We do not have any original copies of the Old Testament. This happened about 600 BC, just before Babylon took the uh, captive people captive in, in, uh, into Babylon from, from Jerusalem. Um, this was the Old Testament, the, the master copy, if you will, of the Old Testament was taken by the Nephites to the New World. Now, the first copies of you we've got of any writing is far after that in the old world. Even the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls don't date back much before 200 BC. That's 400 years after these plates were taken from Jerusalem. At any rate, all of these refer to the brass plates and they are of Christ, inspired of Christ. And there are certain characters here where Christ caused them or commanded things to happen. And so that's why this character is slightly different from this one. Now let's go to the next set of slides, this, this set right here. There is something common that's in all of these, and that's this S-shaped curve here. That means testimony, and it goes through the stroke for plates. Down here, you see the S-shape down at the bottom. And over here, the S-shape, the top of it's a little difficult to distinguish, but that's the same S-shape for plates. Now, those are all testimony plates. They are testifying of what? And I want to show you this character right here. And I'll tell you that this S-shaped character, backwards S-shaped character, means Jesus. And this curved line right here means Lord. And so this is Jesus Lord testimony plates. This is a testimony of Jesus, right from the handwriting of Mormon. Now down here, we have a character, Christ tongue, which means the Jaredite language. I won't bother to go into why it is, but that Christ tongue is the Jaredite language. Here's the Christ tongue, Jaredite language. This is the Christ plates. And so all of these characters down here deal with the Jaredite record. Now, that means we can go into this character's transcript and pinpoint the characters as to where they came from and what, what particular set of plates they're dealing with. 
Now, this is what's in the Book of Mormon right now in this blue box. That's all Joseph Smith ever saw. He never saw the brass plates. He never saw the large plates of Nephi. He never saw the 24 gold plates of Jaredite record or King Messiah's translation of them. He saw Mormon's, a Moroni's abridgment of the Jaredite record and he saw Moron, our Mormon's abridgment of the large plates of Nephi. One more step. Here are the characters. This is saying from the testimony plates of Nephi. This is the large plates from the testimony plates of Nephi. This was produced. These are the brass plates. Christ caused to be the testimony plates for Israel prophetic. Down here, these are testimony plate writings, but they're referring to the Jaredite record. This was testimony plate of Nephi. This is the brother of Jared plates our brother Jared record, King Messiah, Christ plates. All of that is written in here, and I've already covered this one, Jesus Christ, Lord, or Jesus, Lord, testimony plates. We can identify which of those plates are being talked about. Now, if you want some information about what I've given you, further information, here's my website, bookunsealed.com. You can go there and you'll find a book that tells how I developed this. It gives my testimony in it, has details of the translation. The details of the translation right now are slightly different than they would have been when I wrote this book in, 2000, in 2019, and this is my email if anybody wants to talk to me. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Blair. All right, sounds good. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, Casey, how about if you go next, please? Okay, I will. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think two weeks ago I came on and uh, was very pleased to be able to share um, a project I've been working on. And this is the, the latest iteration of it. Uh, it's called Book of Mormon Online. It's a uh, website, also works on mobile. Um, that enables people to, to approach the text of the Book of Mormon in a way that uh, is more reader friendly, that focuses on chronology and focuses on themes and uh, has the intent of, of uh, helping people actually complete uh, the text. The, the, main, the main features that, that you'll see here are the, uh, the 12 primary um, categories in which I've grouped all of the all of the text here, and the, each one has an outline that represents a section. And any uh, any particular section, if you uh, if you click on it, it will take you into the text and present uh, present that page in in such a way that the outline that was um, that was presented in that table of contents uh, corresponds to these section headings. And um, and then there's little summaries on the left on the left side that lets you easily skim it. If you're if you're wondering what was going on, how did we get here? Uh, help me understand what this is saying. Then then that left side is is there to help you. And on the right side we have these little collapsible boxes that open, and that actually show the uh, the text as it's found in the Book of Mormon. Um, now I tried to uh, to be mindful of the various uh, editions and 
uh, the formats that this text um, took throughout history, which is why you're able to see it in uh, both the, the original version, all of the versions that were printed in Joseph Smith's lifetime, as well as the, uh, the, the printer's manuscript, which is, you can see it written here in Oliver Cowdery's uh, handwriting as well. Um, so that's uh, that's the the main thrust um, of of this uh, effort was to be able to present the text and and provide supplement. You can see that um, that here we have uh, some uh, images and illustrations that that correspond with it with things as well as uh, uh, commentaries. That if you if you click here, you can find out. Uh, you know, you can see what people have written about the text that that you have just uh, encountered. So there's um, there's a lot of other features, but in the, for the sake of, of brevity, I want to focus that uh, focus on one thing in particular. Um, you can see that there's little, these little text boxes that uh, that appear below. It, this allows people to come in and to uh, make their own comments, to write their own thoughts, uh, insights, impressions, uh, and what have you. Um, last time I we made a a group that corresponding to the Book of Mormon's per perspective. Uh, Perspectives forum here, and uh, I'm going to reshare that that link for those that uh, that want to jump back in, or if you didn't get a chance to join um, beforehand, um, what uh, what you'll find is if you click on this, uh, you will find yourself in a chat room of sorts with everyone else in in the group. Uh, so here we have everyone from from last week that. Um, that are from last time, I guess it was two weeks ago, that signed up. And you can see what the most recent commentary is. So uh, Corey, who who joined us last time and and uh, who was, he's, um, he's a Methodist who has taken an interest in the Book of Mormon. And he, um, he was he was with us two weeks ago. Uh, he just made a comment here saying, wow, these guys are real jerks in reference to uh, Layman and Lemuel. Um, uh, disparaging Nephi's efforts here. So, you know, if I were to 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 click on this, this would take me into the very piece of text that Corey commented on there, and I would then be in a position to to respond, to agree with Corey, to uh, react or, or respond to his uh, to his comment, or to add to add my own perspective. Is that actually they're not really jerks? They're actually, you know, whatever it might be. Um, my my purpose here is not to to start flame wars. But but rather just to uh, provide a platform in which these these conversations can take place. So so here's what we were just talking about. So so what this means is that here in the arrival and bountiful section, Corey came across this. He he read here you know this this section here and uh, highlighted it and responded saying that that these um, uh, that these that they were jerks. So I'm going to like this and I'm going to say um, you know I'll say Layman and Lemuel's. Um, uh, you know, strong suit was not agreeableness, uh, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> okay. And, and so that was just my comment here. So anybody else could, could come in here and, and, you know, we could comment on this thread the way you might on, on a, on Facebook or a social network. Now, in addition to that, if you go to the home, the home feed, this is where, you know, some, some of these study groups are public. Some of them are private. If it's private and you're in it, or if it's public, uh, and and whatnot, you'll be able to see kind of what conversations are happening on the homepage. So so the one that that we just saw right there, Corey's message right here, my response here. Anybody else can can then respond to it too. And you can scroll down and say, okay, well, what you know, what had Jonathan uh, mentioned earlier? You can see what other public groups are there. You can see Corey commented in a different group. He's in multiple groups, and he noticed that okay, the still small voice here seems to be an echo of Kings nineteen twelve. Which if you click on this. Uh, takes you to the actual reference that he's talking that he's talking about. So um, you know th this provides a a way that people can um, can come and and have these types of of discussions. Um, I'll, I'll wrap things up here, but there's there's a lot of other appendices here, and and just uh, in reference to the um, to the previous um, uh, presentation, I do want to show that I have a, a forthcoming analysis section uh, which includes. Uh, data sets mainly, and I actually have one on the characters document. And now I'm very excited to take the research that uh, was just just presented and see see if I can incorporate it here. What what this is is an analysis of of all the characters, breaks them down, and shows uh, you know which ones are similar, which ones 
uh, where do they appear in in what context? I don't have any attempt of translation here, which is why I'm I'm very interested to to take uh, the, the research that, that we just saw and and see what we can do with this. But um, going forward, there's going to be a lot more uh, kind of sideshows, if you will, of data sets and research that um, that I want to make accessible, make easy to to consume, and kind of turn it into a one stop shop for both Book of Mormon study for Book of Mormon research. Uh, and and I want to be open to a variety of views um, in in terms of geography. Uh, you know, I've got a map section here, and I try to represent the major the major theories that are that are uh, available. And um, you know, I think this should be a place where people can can have the the discussions. Everyone can agree that the text exists, and as long as we can agree on that, then then this is a place where where I think we can have uh, productive discussions, regardless of how we end up interpreting the text. Or, um, or or the differences in our approaches to it. So uh, that's the Book of Mormon online. Um, please join the group and uh, sign up for, for an account and, and have a good time with it. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. It has been a real interesting um, site for sure. Let's see, um, Eric. All right, let me share my screen. So everybody can see that. Yep. Okay. So uh, have all this, well, most of this information on bookofmormoninfo.com website. Um, so I, I mentioned kind of starting off that I take the words of the Book of Mormon uh, as precedence over prophecy. Uh, the words can be treated as factual as we possibly can have them because they were translated by the power of a seer and the scriptures um, the power of the seer is greater than a prophet um, so in my viewpoint prophecy must be consistent with the word descriptions and uh, also prophecy requires interpretation which makes them open to change based on how the interpretation is made um, and also, the prophecies are, are not real specific about the location of the prophecies as being the same or maybe different location as what we have in the Book of Mormon word descriptions. I mentioned that the uh, worldview of the people in the seventh century BC in the Middle East um, believe the sea, uh, seas surrounded the world and the world was a flat plate. And we can see a reference to this in Helaman 578 or 1422 in the LDS version, where it says face of the whole earth, yea, both above the earth and beneath. So, you know, we have references like that in the Book of Mormon, knowing that they had the, the same world reference uh, that we do know the people in the Middle East had. Also, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, people in the 7th century BC viewed the North Sea, South Sea, East Sea, and West Sea as on the outermost portion of the world. And the fact that the Mediterranean Sea was what they considered a, a lagoon or extension of the West Sea that they could see in the Middle East, and likewise the uh, Indian Ocean um, or what they called the Yamsup, um, was just an extension or a lagoon, if you will, uh, of the South Sea that was coming up to uh, where they could see it. But they, to them, that was just proof that the South Sea was at the very extremity of the world. So the uh, conclusion is Helaman 2.8 in the RLDS, 3.8 in the LDS version, is really a description of a, a metaphor um, of what their view of the, the world was. Uh, we also took a look at looking at the scriptures, uh, verses in the uh, Book of Mormon, putting them all together, that they are consistent that the land south of Zarahemla is rising terrain, uh, which means the river of Sidon is flowing northward. Um, there was a description or question about interpretation of the head of the river Sidon. Um, in the Book of Mormon, it uh, describes 
the head of the Sidon being the source, um, uh, essentially the most uphill portion of the river Sidon. And looking at uh, Genesis 2.10 was used as a reference and uh, two words uh, as I looked at Genesis 2.10. Um, so the end of the four heads is the Hebrew Rosh. And by all biblical scholars, that means source or commencement, not a confluence. Um, the uh, description of the meaning of Rosh uh, is really good in uh, Just Neus's, uh, Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, the URL is there if you want to go take a look at it. Also, what I noticed was that the verb uh, parted or parad uh, actually means separate or divide, indicating the four rivers were not connected. So this is actually an opposite definition of a confluence. Took a look at some of the, uh, call it proofs, um, that are in the words in the Book of Mormon. Uh, we have the, uh, what I call the proof of the intersecting valleys. Uh, it's in the RLDS 662 to 680 or in the LDS 1426 to 158, where you have people that are in the narrow neck region that go um, to warring factions, um, go to the East Coast, uh, the Sea East Coast, have a battle, and then they go away from there and they travel through two valleys on their way to a body of water, which is considered the largest body of water. And uh, there really is only one place in the world this exists, and this is in Mesoamerica. Um, and these valleys don't exist on any maps until after 1865. So the question is, how would Joseph Smith know about those? I have kind of one of my favorite proofs. Um, this is where it talks about the west and east valleys of the River Sidon. And it occurs where a place where the River Sidon goes from a place that is not wilderness to a place of wilderness. So you can see on the map here, the light green is the not wilderness or the flat area and the wilderness, um, the hilly area as in the more browns here. And uh, talked about the whole situation in the East Valley, uh, the West Valley, uh, why there's significance of this uh, river system coming down through is the only way through the mountainous area. Uh, so uh, the terrain here is exactly where the Book of Mormon has these places described. And the real key thing here is the Valley West does not show up on maps until after 1922 to 1934. Um, so again, how would Joseph Smith know about the West Valley? And we talked about um, Helaman uh, 2, 8 through 10 in the RLDS or 3, 8 through 10 in the LDS version, talking about uh, shipping timber from where it is to where it isn't. And in Mexico, it's um, very easy that in the narrow neck area, there's actually a natural lagoon system, which is a great harbor for boats. And uh, the river system, because the land northward is described as the land of many rivers, um, as it empties into the West Sea, uh, is a very navigable river, but this is all uh, lacking in timber. So it easily explained by uh, moving timber from where it is in the narrow neck to where it isn't. And so you put all that together. And so when I review or look at models that don't have the seas at the extremities of the world, um, Zarahemla uh, is not on the Mississippi River because terrain on the Mississippi River decreases in altitude as you go south, it does not increase. 
and there's no place for the intersecting valleys south of Zarahemla on the Mississippi River, if that's where you want to put it in your model. I uh, did find a really good source. Um, have the URL for it here. Uh, actually talks about that Zarahemla was not even mentioned by Joseph Smith in the LDS DNC 125, that uh, the reference to Zarahemla was actually added after his death. So that's also kind of part and parcel with trying to understand prophecy is actually understanding what was originally said and making sure you're not working off of a, an edited version. So that's what I had. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Appreciate that. And uh, I don't see any other presenters on. Don't think I'm missing anybody. Um, does anybody have any questions for Eric or Casey or did Blair leave us? Looks like, oh no, Blair's still here. Anybody have any questions for those three presenters who are still here with us? Our group has kind of dwindled this evening. I'm trying to be here. Oh, there you are. Okay. I'm really impressed with the other presenters and uh, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to get uh, my stuff together to work, but I recognize that uh, in a company like this, that that the other presentations probably deserve to take priority anyway. So thank you. And thanks for keeping the plug in the lung to stick with us, Paul. Well, I'm sorry that that uh, my connections in Nauvoo are just so poor that I am not uh, necessarily able to tie into the rest of the world with any continuity. Interesting how. For the last uh, 20 minutes or so, actually, I got to hear the last part of Blair's presentation and I've had pretty good connection ever since. But earlier, I just kept getting disconnected and so it was most frustrating. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions or discussion? Carol, go ahead and unmute, please. Um, Mr. Kern, C. Kern, wh where did you get your pictures on your presentations? Are those Mormon pictures, the paintings and stuff? Uh, yeah, let me uh, let me pull that up. Um, so the majority of them, um, let's see. Are, are you referring to the the ones that kind of represent? Um, uh, let me share my screen here. Do you, do you mean the ones that are in line or the ones that are um, uh, that represent their in the table of contents? Detailed paintings. So the, these some come from. That... Yeah, um, I mean, so some of these. This one's like Ar Arnold Freeberg. This this is Minerva Tyker. This is R Walter Rain. Um, I, I actually, if I can uh, get, get the funding for it, I, I would actually like to get some original art uh, on here right now. Right now, th these are just kind of from the uh, the picture kits that kind of come along with, with the Book of Mormon. But um, I think uh, what we were looking at earlier, um, there the are some- Gladiation period. That one is especially a Book of Mormon, uh, Mormon's rendition. The yeah, yes, that, 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 that one's the Arnold Freiburg. Um, version what, what you do have is throughout the text here i think this is what we looked at before you have some of these the, the, these are mainly from the uh the, the children's uh the children's books um the first uh the let's see one of the main ones is um is this one this is an, uh, an lds church publication um that just kind of has uh, some summaries with with some with some paintings that uh, that go with it. 
Uh, the, the other one is is a little a little more tricky to find. Um, uh, is the illustrated? Let's see. Let me see if I can if I can find this. Um, um, it, uh, let's see. If you search like illustrated, here we go. It's um, it's the it's the sixteen volume set called. Illustrated stories from the Book of Mormon. I think this was published in the 1970s or so. It's now since been redone as a as an ebook. Yeah, here, here we go. Um, and so and so little excerpts from these. I think I think that's where uh, where this one comes from. Um, I just figured out what passage they correspond to, and and uh, and and there, there's a link to. Here we go. If you, if you click on it, there's a, a link that you can get the, the full uh, the full volume. So that's you that, that's all. Yeah. Do you have to struggle with uh, copyright issues at that point? So um, I'm I'm never uh, presenting the entire work. Um, I I uh, you only get you know a, an image here or there at at a time. That um, and actually the the same goes for uh, for comment for commentaries. What what happens is so I have the legal notice here. Um, when you start looking through the the commentaries, it's actually tracking what percent of the entire work um, has been accessed uh, so far, and and that's to comply with uh, the uh, uh, the title, the U.S. Code, Title Seventeen, Section One Hundred Seven, which is which is the uh, the primary uh, copyright law, and um, it's uh, let's see the 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 clause. That's the the legal defense at this point is is the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. So um, once once uh, access as recorded by by usage exceeds a certain level, I can actually shut off uh, access to not run into legal troubles. Um, I have not I, I have received a little legal counsel for this, but I, I haven't run into any issues. This has been at, at such a scale that uh, it hasn't raised any eyebrows um, yet, but I, I have done my homework as far as uh, legal, um, as what laws are in the books and, and what are the um, the exemptions to it. I also wondered about your references because the LDS and RLDS Book of Mormons are so off when it comes to the uh, numbers. So right. how can you reference with these, you're talking verse 32 in one book and you're talking right. ages different verses than the other how do you handle yeah. the differences between well you know I, I hadn't really even considered uh <laughs> that uh, until recently um i did i did recently get a, con a concordance that has you know the equivalent chapters and verses across um across the various um editions and, and of course if you look at the uh, you know the early ones they didn't have verse numbers at all uh so what, what I have, I haven't implemented this yet, but I am I am committed to doing this at some point. There is a preference thing right here where you can choose what commentaries get shown. You can, you know, do you want the illustrations on or off? Do you want um, do you want the audio on and off? Things like that. I, I'm planning on adding a section here for when you're looking at this in the English version to be able to choose your reference and have have a drop down list. You know, I I want it in. Uh, you know, and, and kind of pick pick whatever reference schema is out there. So I don't have that that yet. Um, but that is that is something that I do intend to to do. I think it would be useful uh, and and beneficial, especially as as we expand the take off the blinders uh, and see that there's a variety of communities that that are interested in this text. Thank you and uh, wonderful job. Thank you. Blair, go ahead, please. Uh, let's see. My mic on. Yeah, your mic. Can you on. hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. I'm uh, wondering if there are people who are interested in learning how to read the Anthem characters. Um, I am starting to head toward uh, small presentations which will introduce each of the basic characters. Now there are only 20 basic characters. They can be added together to give different meanings. And uh, so I can build on the 20 basic characters and where 
a person can basically look at a character, see what the, the elements are of the character, and therefore find the meaning of it. And in that way can read it. Uh, it's not reading as we do in English where we have sounds that we're producing, but it's words and how the words can be put together to make new words. Uh, I'm wondering if, if this group of people, if, if there are anybody here that would like to work on something like that, and if I were to make a 10 minute presentation on, let's say the character for tongue or the character for plates, um, would people like to hear that? Would people like to study that? Uh, I plan to do the work. I'm 90 years old and I haven't got much time left. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm going to I'm going to do that work if the Lord gives me time. So uh, anybody here interested in working with me on that and uh, following it, I would be like to have some help. <laughs> no takers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like a wonderful opportunity, Blair, and there are quite a few people who have left our group so far, but it will be on the recording. Your invitation will be on the recording, so um, I'm sure there will be others who will view that as well. Oh, okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions or comments? Paul, do you have any news coming from the dig this week or so far this this time around? Am I live? I'm not sure if I yes, am muted. We, we can hear you. All right. So we have uh, we have had thirty BYU students for uh, three mornings, and the result has been that the basement floor now has been largely cleared and uh, yes we do have results at this stage i am confident that uh, water street is a pre-mormon structure i am confident that the basement structure that uh, was the first times of the seasons is also a pre-mormon structure and so the idea of, of rebuilding the uh, times of the seasons means that we rebuild a pre-Mormon structure which was built without mortar as the basement. And that's the basement I think that that uh, Ebenezer Robinson and Don Carlos Smith got sick in when they were trying to publish the first times of the seasons in 1839. They got it, uh, they started in July and got it out in November. And then Don Carlos died and the, uh, and, and the building was expanded up on top and oriented north and south. And so we're seeing the disorientation of the two foundations and the uh, simple fact that the frame structure put on top is the one that, that presumably is going to be re rebuilt means that uh, we have a question about how to preserve the warehouse structure that was underneath it. In any case, we are finding clear evidence that the building was not just used as a warehouse or first times and seasons and, and second times and seasons, but it was also a domicile. We have numerous pieces of, uh, of decorated ceramics, quite a lot of container glass, uh, quite a lot of square nails. And uh, we now have, a, I think, uh, something over 20 pieces of type that have been found this season. And that's particularly exciting because most of the type is of the four point ruby design. And I think that's the same design that was used in the 1840 Book of Mormon. And then we also have several pieces of, of the six point bourgeois. And those are the two types that uh, we found primarily in, in the 1976 excavation. 
We have not been successful at finding the outhouse yet. We're still looking for that one. We are anticipating more visitors, more more volunteers, uh, but we have a great deal of openings in the next uh, three weeks for volunteers to come work with us. Stephen Pineker and uh, I think Rick Bennett are coming to Nauvoo next week, and so we're expecting and hoping to have them uh, on the on the volunteer crew in the middle of next week. And any of the rest of you that would like to, I dig Nauvoo is our webpage, and uh, you can register there and come spend a few hours or a few days with us. And uh, being able to find some type, being able to participate in the rest restoration of this rather remarkable um, building of such significance, I think it, it, well, it's fun and instructive. So if, uh, yeah, let me extend the invitation and say thank you for giving a consideration because it does tie to our Book of Mormon Forum. Um, Book of Mormon was actually published there in 1840. You found a piece of lead. Oh, yes. <laughs> a couple of other interesting elements. Uh, one, we found a piece of mica. And the old timers uh, like myself might possibly remember that mica was used in the foundry uh, oven doors. And the grade school in, uh, where I went in Ringgold County, Riley Township, uh, first year of my education, we had mica in the door of the, of the oven, of the stove. And I see Carol nodding her head to recognize that too. Well, Ebenezer Robinson, when he rebuilt the Times and Seasons, built a foundry there. And so he was melting down the lead in the tin to make his own type. And he, if he had a foundry, then he would have had a foundry with a, with an oven with a door with mica in it, very likely. And we found a piece of that mica. Uh, that to me is a rather exciting little connection. Uh, what else was it, Rena? <laughs> oh, and and it was fun for me because last Thursday I was driving down the the road next to the river, and we drove past the uh, Moffat House. Dan Moffat was in his driveway, and so I turned around and went back to speak with him because we've had a longer-term relationship. The Moffat House was built in 1823, and it's still occupied by the Moffat family. They knew Joseph Smith's family. Uh, the, uh, the daughter, Julia, who uh, they adopted in Kirtland, died uh, after coming back to Nauvoo with cancer. She stayed a couple of years with Emma. Emma died in 79, and then she went to the Moffats and lived with them for the last two years of her life. And they buried her in the, in the Moffat uh, Cemetery, the Catholic Cemetery here in Nauvoo. So here's a very close relationship between the Moffats and the, and the Smiths. Well, Dan, Dan was, uh, was kind enough to point out that Robert E. Lee had been here. He couldn't remember when, but I happened to, to have seen the maps so or remembered it too. But he said when Robert Lee dredged the Mississippi, the uh, Des Moines Rapids, to make it so it'd be open for the boats. And he mentioned that uh, Lee's map showed the Moffat House. Lee's map was 1835. So here is a document demonstrating that the road that went from uh, Captain James White's house out on the point of Nauvoo, past the homestead, past the Hibbert House, down past the Moffat House, that road is, the, is, is Water Street. And the Mormons simply expanded it by the red brick store and by, by the Homestead and Mansion House on Main Street, expanded it to 66 feet wide there, but it, uh, it's crooked, narrow, and, uh, and Hiram Smith had his, his uh, store door in the middle of the street. Fascinating. And it just, just uh, the fact is that Water Street pre-existed the Mormons who named their streets with Parley and Sydney and so forth, to, to Mormon names. So uh, just compelling data to uh, demonstrate that our basement is actually a pre-Mormon structure. Oh, and uh, those of you who heard the Tuttle presentation, Boyd Tuttle was advocating that that you come to Montrose and work on the, the Phoenicia. We found the Phoenicia site. We weren't able to get in, but uh, 
it is a nice big building just a little bit off the highway and uh, i understand that they are still inviting people in on the weekdays to uh, put the Phoenicia back together again i'm not particularly meaning to advocate for that for that uh, geography but uh, it is a fascinating tie back to our book of Mormon perspectives uh, forum and and we also found the big the big mound. I I was anxious to find the big mound because I'd read that uh, in 1843 Joseph and Emma had ridden out from the mansion house and uh, went to visit the big mound. And they then he bought it and apparently lost it when he went through the the uh, bankruptcy. bankruptcy and and so. Here's a big mound, the highest point in Hancock County. And Reed and I spent two afternoons driving the roads of this portion of Hancock County looking for that big mound. I had seen it some 30 years ago, so I had a good idea of what it was supposed to look like. And we drove by it twice, but it has been uh, flattened enough that uh, I didn't quite recognize it. We finally called Chuck Tripp and he indicated that we were, well, he, he grew up just Three miles south of it and so he said look you're just one mile away from it so <laughs> go west and sure enough one mile west we looked down the road and there it was and uh, we went to up to the door to ask the farmer to see the artifacts and nobody answered the door so i took pictures and so at least i've got the picture for the matching house book one of the one of the episodes that joseph and emma took a, a trip out of the rent mansion house to uh, go see the big mound and and now I can show where that mound was that they ended up purchasing. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Paul. I have 935. Does anybody else have any comments or questions for any of our presenters? If not, then I'll sing. Good night, the Lord is watching o'er you. Good night, his blessings go before you. Good night, and we'll be praying for you. So good night, may God bless you. And thank you for participating. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Thank, you. thank you, Deb, for covering. You're welcome. We made it through, everybody. Thank you so much. Kathy, thanks for co-hosting with me. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, and thank you, Deb, for, for surviving the COVID. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> We're yeah. praying for you. All right. Good night.